Hi all, I thought it would be a nice idea to recap five of Bobby Fischer's greatest games. These are actually kind of universally considered very good games and they're also five of my favourite games of Bobby Fischer. I believe they have certain philosophical points to make and so with each of these five games I'll try and uh, do a little philosophical summary, five key points for each game at the end of each game. So let's have a look at my first pick and it was coined the game of the century. It was when Bobby Fischer was only just 13 years old. It was against Donald Byrne, one of the Byrne brothers, and it was played in the Rosenwald Memorial Tournament at the Marshall Chess Club in New York City, October 17th, 1956. So Bobby Fischer had actually the black pieces here against Donald Byrne. We see Knight F3, and I'll play the moves myself, so not from a pre-recorded game. Uh, so knight f6, we see c4, and now Fischer played g6, we have knight c3, bishop g7, d4, and black castles. So at the moment, it looks like a potentially, you know, a king's engine defense is emerging here. We have bishop f4, but now instead of d6, we have d5, which makes it more Groomfield style. Queen b3, which is transposing into the Russian system, I believe, where the queen uh, is putting pressure immediately on d5, and white gets sometimes a very nice pawn center. After d takes c4, queen takes c4. There are swings and roundabouts here. Although white has uh, a nice pawn center, the queen might be subject to tempo gains here. We see c6, e4, and I'll give you uh, links actually, you'll see links on each section of each game for the actual very detailed analysis if you want to check that out as well. Here we're just getting a flavour of each game. So after e4, knight bd7, rook d1, and now a tempo game, knight b6. The queen goes to c5, and it looks as there's, there's quite a bind on the black position. This queen uh, perched there, looking at e7, looking on this diagonal where this bishop isn't, so queen c5. We see bishop g4, a bit of pressure perhaps on d4 potentially. It doesn't seem that convincing right now, bishop g4. We have bishop g5, and it looks as though this bind is being set up, but maybe this is a bit of a mistake. It's moving the same piece twice. Bishop e2 might have been safer. Okay, so here uh, there's very, very interesting stuff which starts to happen in this particular position, incredibly. So with the bishop and the queen there, they represent a kind of target for a fork. But can you guess what Fisher played in this position, the first of a series of brilliant moves here in this position? Okay. Black to play, if I give you five seconds to pause the video. Black played knight a4, so it's deflecting this knight away from e4 potentially. So hitting that knight. So very, very interesting. We have queen a3. This uh, looks safer not to accept knight takes e a4. If knight takes a4 had been played, there was knight takes e4. As I say, the detailed analysis, you'll see variations. Here we're sort of mainly just playing through the game, trying to get an, an aesthetic feel for what's happening. So that knight sacrifice was rejected. We have here knight takes c3, b takes, and now, despite the bishop and the queen converging on e7, Fisher played knight takes e4 here, hitting that bishop, threatening things like bishop takes and knight takes. So knight takes e4, we have bishop takes e7, and now queen b6 is played. This is very, very interesting with the king still on e1. These pieces not developed yet. Can the king in the center be exploited? We have bishop c4, and things get really fantastic now. Knight takes c3, clearing uh, that e file for a nasty pin potentially. So knight takes c3, really fascinating. We have bishop c5, rook f e8 check king f1, and now an absolutely brilliant move is played in this position. Most people would move their queen. What did Fisher play, you wonder, in this 
particular position. A really key move here. Okay. It's uh, the double exclam move of the game. So the counter move of the century. Some have written about this move. Okay, bishop e6, so not minding a queen sacrifice. The king, still life one, is not that safe. Now here, if the bishop takes, then this diagonal here can be used uh, to checkmate the white king. So uh, we can rule that out. This is very, very interesting here. Uh, if bishop takes, queen b5 check, and you can see that if king e1, queen e2 is mate, and if here, then knight e2 check, and here the double check, knight g3, and here queen f1, and knight e2 is smothered the mate. So that's to be avoided, bishop takes e6. I knew I, 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 know I said not too much analysis, but I can't resist that one. So here, the queen sacrifice was actually uh, accepted. So we have bishop takes b6. Fisher now grabs one piece with check, bishop c4 check, and it goes into a, a kind of windmill tactic scenario. So knight e2 check, bringing the king back to f1. Knight takes d4 check. So a windmill tactic here, getting material. King g1. And we have now knight e2 check again. King f1, knight c3 check. Okay, king g1. And now we have a takes b6, hitting the queen. So quite a bit of material is being accumulated here after a takes b6. Queen b4. And now a really nice move with tempo rook a4. So protecting the bishop, hitting the queen. Queen takes b6. Knight takes d1. So a vast amount of material for that queen is being accumulated. h3. Rook takes a2. What has happened here? King h2. We have knight takes f2, chipping away at the king a little bit, coordinating rook, protecting that knight, so that's able to be taken. Knight takes f2. Rook e1, white simplifies, rook takes e1. We have queen d8 check. Okay, there's a pin, but it's pretty mostly uh, harmless. Knight takes e1. And now we have the centralizing bishop d5 trying to coordinate on g2. Knight f3. We have knight e4. And this supports the idea potentially of bishop d6 if this is unpinned. That would be extremely dangerous for white's king safety. Queen b8, b5, h4, h5, knight e5. And now unpinning king g7, which unleashes the potential of bishop d6. This is very, very bad for white at this point. It looks pretty hopeless. King g1, white is a sport here and plays on. Bishop c5 check. The king is pushed from one side of the board to another. Up to king g1. Um, we have here, sorry, king f1. We have now knight g3 check. King e1. Bishop b4 check. King d1, bishop b3 check, king c1, now knight e2 check, king b1, knight c3. It's beautiful coordination of the pieces to deliver a checkmate. King c1, rook c2, check, mate. Wow. It's uh, a really uh, breathtaking game, actually. Uh, just to recap on it is, is a real pleasure. So, um, at move 41, uh, rook c2 chat mate. So what are the five philosophical points I'd like to share today? 
Well, I think it shows that binds, why it was trying to bind black, binds can be spectacularly broken. We see that later in World Championship matches. Um, there's a fantastic bind broken in a Karpov Kasparov game named the, like the Kasparov Gambit, which is one of my favourite games as well. So when one is playing a positional opponent, they might try and get such a grip on the position. But sometimes a tactician can break that bind. Uh, point two, philosophical point two, be aware that if your king's in the centre, it is a bit of a liability. Uh, so in that respect, point three, that links with point three, moving pieces twice, especially when your king's in the centre, uh, can be punished sometimes. Point four, the queen in particular is pretty sensitive to tempo gains, important tempo gains. We saw key tactics which hinged on attacking the queen. Uh, so when you bring out the queen and open, uh, be, be aware of that risk, as well as moving pieces twice, especially doing all this when your king's in the center. Point five, thinking of queen sacrifices. Sometimes that's really what you need to do, a queen sacrifice, uh, to be open-minded about even the outrageous possibilities on the chessboard. So I thought those are five interesting philosophical points. Uh, there's probably more to be made, but I'm summing them up for me today, personally, from my experience, to those five uh, are quite interesting to gather from this particular game. So I hope you enjoyed this first game choice. And yeah, you should, should see uh, a link to the detailed annotation video for this particular game if you want to, to get into the meat and potatoes of the variations. So check that out. Okay, our second game, let's reset the board. And uh, Fisher was playing black again, against this time, uh, the brother actually of Donald Byrne, Robert Eugene Byrne. This was in 1963, the US Chess Championship of 1963. So very strong brothers uh, here, which Fisher <laughs> had played a few games against each. So in this game, we see d4. So both brothers seem to like the positional openings. Uh, so knight f6 from Fisher, c4. We have g6, g3. This is looking like a very solid choice from white. c6, bishop g2, d5, c takes. And you'll see that this creates a symmetrical pawn structure. c takes, knight c3. And also the pieces are pretty symmetrical at the moment. So after bishop g7, e3, black castles, knight g e2, knight c6. Okay, there's some piece placement uh, differences though. Uh, so the knight's on e2, this one's on f6. Uh, so that bishop is clear, uh, has a target on d5, clearly. So knight uh, g e2, knight c6. We have castling. And now b6, putting the bishop potentially on interesting diagonal. B3, white imitates black with that. So maybe this diagonal for white is equally interesting. So how to imbalance, imbalance this symmetrical kind of variation? We have bishop a6, bishop a3, yes, mirroring black's play here. Uh, is anything radical about to happen? Rook e8, and we have queen d2, and now White's, White's position seems totally designed against black playing e5 because isn't d5 weak? Well, Fisher rebelled here in the position. He did accept a potentially isolated and vulnerable d pawn by playing e5. In return, he gets quite a lot of pressure here after d takes. Knight takes, there's pressure on that semi open file. There's a coordination point on d3. The knight's looking quite aggressive on f3. So very interesting position. Now here, perhaps a slight inaccuracy using this rook. Maybe this rook's better because this weakens f2. And in fact, it's f2, which is very, very interesting now. So this might be the case of the wrong rook, as Fisher mentioned in his annotations for this for this game. Is it the wrong rook? Knight d3 looks at that f2, which has been neglected by that move, rook fd1. Okay, we have now uh, the threat of knight e4, white plays queen c2. And there's a spectacular move in this position. I wonder if you can guess it. If I give you five seconds to pause the video, starting from 
now. And actually, I remember this inspiring me on my uh, in one of my early tournaments at the Halifax Under One Hundred and Sixty ECF tournament many years back. Uh, this kind of sacrifice, okay. Knight takes f two. It really weakens White's king. It undermines the pawn chain. It opens up the possibilities on the dark squares quite a lot. Now, after king takes, we have knight g four check hitting e three and h2 there's a lot of pressure on the dark squares this bishop could run rampant potentially king g1 knight takes e3 so four king queen and bishop and rook is the point to win the rook or not this is the really really interesting point after queen d2 so it looks as though you know knight takes d1 rook takes and this pawn's going to drop later it's vulnerable but there's a real shocker here a total shocker move which uh, many grandmasters thought white was better here, but this changes the picture dramatically. It's, in fact, I'd consider it one of my most, one of my favourite type of moves that I've ever seen on a chessboard because it's it's kind of so unexpected. There's a lure of winning the rook here. What would you play if I give you five seconds to pause the video? Okay. Knight takes g2 instead of taking the rook. It weakens the light squares around the king. And once that's done, you want this bishop involved. And now, now another spectacular kind of move to make sure this bishop is going to celebrate these light squares. Guess what Fisher plays here? Okay. d4, opening up this diagonal. Really fantastic move. Knight takes d4. Bishop b7 check. King F one, and now <laughs> after this next move, uh, White actually resigns. Guess what Fisher plays? Okay, look at this crossfire. These beautiful bishops crossfiring the board here. Fisher plays Queen D seven. So looking at Queen H three, and White actually resigned. So Fisher was hoping uh, White would play on. For example. If white, this is one of many variations. Check out uh, the link up there. So queen f2, check, and you see that here the queen is guarding g2, for example. Can you see what black can play in this position? A really uh, brilliant tactic here. Okay, rook e1, check. So if queen takes queen g2, rook takes, it drags the rook away. Bishop takes d4. We'll be uh, mating white soon. You know, after rookie three, bishop takes, and then there's threat of mate. For example, here, mate. So that would have been that would have been a fantastic finish. So, what do I see from this game in terms of five key philosophical points? Well, the first one is that symmetrical positions can be dangerous potentially, especially the way Fisher played it. He's, he's prepared to change the pawn structure to uh, make his pieces more dynamic, and aggressive, and aggressive, even accepting the isolated queen's pawn. So point two, uh, yeah, in particular, linked to that, you know, watch out for the opponents creating counterplay, even with isolated queen's pawns, especially your soft spots. Once the opponent's um, got some peace play like this, your soft spots become more evident. So sometimes you've got to be a bit more discerning about which rook to move, because uh, that's uh, point three, is watch out for the soft spots around your king, like f2. Uh, point four, watch out for undermining uh, peace sacrifices that both undermine pawn structure and reduce king safety. So that was a fantastic knight takes f2 in this game. Point five, check out for bishops being potentially liberated, especially after move like knight takes g2, when a color complex around the king especially has been weakened, then this bishop is absolutely superb later without the counterpart on that diagonal. Uh, you know, making queen d7 absolutely a crushing move because it's going to coordinate with the queen. So I thought those five points are interesting to get from this particular amazing game. It did really leave a great impression on me, this beautiful game masterpiece. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that one. Okay, let's have a look at game three. This is from the 1972 World Chess Championship. This is my favorite game from that match. Fisher was actually, let's flip the board, playing with the white pieces. 
and played c4. So he was going against the Soviet preparation by bypassing e4 in this match. c4, e6, we have knight f3, d5 from Boris Pasky, d4. So yes, believe it or not, Fisher's playing with the white pieces here. Knight f6, knight c3, knight c3, bishop e7, bishop g5. So queen's game had declined. e3, h6, bishop h4, b6. And now c takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. Knight takes d5, and apparently this was theory at the time. This is all theory. So Fisher has been keeping up with all this theory in this particular variation. Rook c1 for trying to get a small edge. Bishop e6. We have this interesting move, queen a4. So preparing to do something against c5, namely pin this pawn now after, with queen a3. So pinning that pawn. Very interesting position. Rook c8. And now bishop b5 a6 and that pawn's pinned so that's actually not threatened yet d takes giving black hanging pawns so-called hanging pawns so one of the strategies is you try and fix them down a bit white castled black unpinned and that rook's protected so a takes is now threatened so here uh, the bishop drops back knight d7 and now using that pin uh, knight d4 now taking out this bishop will give this bishop without a counterpart and the potential pressure on knight square. So this is interesting. Even though the bishop doesn't seem to be doing much, it is adding to the solidity of the black position, especially on the light squares, this move knight d4. So white's kind of undermining potentially uh, that solidity. Uh, so we have here queen f8 and Fisher snaps up that and now drills into the light squares with a really fantastic move. Uh, so one of my favorite moves of this game. Can you guess what Fisher played in this position if I give you five seconds starting from now? Okay, so at move 20, what did Fisher play here? Okay, e4, trying to undermine these pawns. This pawn sack is very, very dicey for black, literally. all If you look at the black pawn chain, it would be a wreck if black did that. And it gives the c4 square anyway, as in the game. Black actually decided here at move 20 to play d4. So the light squares are being undermined actually here. We have f4, queen e7, e5, and this kind of locks out the knight. The knight's kind of passive compared to its counterpart piece, uh, the bishop. The bishop's got that nice c4 square. So move 22, e5, we have rook b8. Bishop c4, king h8. And now the queen switches over here looking at e6. So black's pretty passive here. Knight f8 defending e6. b3 solidifying the queen side, a5. We have f5, so rupturing that f file, opening up things uh, on the f file. e takes, rook takes. So this looks kind of dangerous already, this f file. Knight h7. We have doubling the rooks. Rook c, f1. Uh, queen d8. Queen g3. Rook e7. h4 restricting the knight again. This poor knight's been tortured in this game. Rook b, b7. e6. Rook b, c7. Queen e5, a nice square for the queen, pinning that pawn on g7. Well, it's dominating the position here. The queen is better placed, it seems, than this queen. Queen e8, this 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 pawn is pretty solidly defended by that bishop. Uh, so there doesn't seem too much uh, to worry about here in this position. After queen e8, so that's that move. Uh, 32, we have a4, locking down the queen side. Black has reduced the passivity here. Queen e8. Rook 1, f2, queen e8. A bit of high level shuffling, waiting for the time control perhaps. So here, bishop d3 switching to this diagonal. Queen e8, black is waiting around. Queen e4 setting up a very dangerous battery now. 
Uh, so yeah, it looks really dangerous. Knight f6. We have rook takes f6. So this is threatening mate. The recapture defends h7 at least for the moment. So an amazing exchange sack. It has reduced black's king safety. And uh, yeah, there's only one lonely pawn there on h6 now. So really uh, powerful logical exchange sack. Uh, we have king g8 uh, on move 40 now. Very, very dangerous position. Bishop c4. So this reinforces things like <laughs> rook f7, among other things. There's all sorts of great things for white uh, to do here. We have king h8. Now queen f4 and black had to resign here. His king's been totally compromised. Uh, white's just absolutely crashing through in this final position. Check out, as I say, the analysis links uh, for the detailed game video I've done on this game. Really fantastic game. So queen f4, black had to resign, but the king's safety is just getting worse and worse here. The philosophical points uh, to make about this game, I thought, especially in match situations or against opponents that uh, you're playing quite a bit, maybe try and surprise them with opening theory that they couldn't anticipate. That's an interesting practical point, I thought. Two, make use of pins. We had a pin here for strategic reasons like weakening a color complex, not just taking a measure, but weakening the whole light square color complex. Three, when undermining uh, light squares, think of positional pawn sacrifices. So we saw e4 positional pawn sack. Four, switch about how to think, <laughs> think about how to switch resources from the queen side to the king side. So there was a central pawn wedge established, which helped restrict the knight, but it also meant the queen could switch over to the king side. Five, consider exchange sacrifices as a really natural way of improving great position. So the the exchange sack was really so natural, damaging uh, the king's safety even further and compromising uh, the king and winning uh, more material potentially as these pawns are also fractured. So very, very interesting points there, I thought, to get from this game in general. So that was a very, very interesting game as well. Okay, let's have a look at another fine game. Let's reset the board. Here in this game in 1967, the Suez, Suez, Suez International 1967, uh, Fisher was playing against Lamshuren Magmashuren. Uh, we have e4 from Fisher, e6. D3, so Fisher was a fan against the French defence of the King's Engine attack. So it's uh, kind of, it looks like a kind of timid approach, but it's got a lot of latent power, kind of cooled spring, coiled spring power where uh, latent energy built, built, building up here. So G3, C5, Bishop G2, Knight C6, Knight GF3, Bishop E7, both sides castle. E5, and this is a very strong sort of point to overprotect. I'm fond of Nimzovich's overprotection of E5 in particular. You get a sort of bind on the position if you can just reinforce a central point. Sometimes we have rook E1, black tries to get some queenside counterplay. B5, knight F1, B4, but now white plays on the king side, H4. Portraying a few ideas which Fisher has reused in many games. The idea of getting a sort of battering ram pawn or form pawn to h6 to weaken and puncture these dark squares. And knights can often go to this one, can often go to g4 sometimes. And the bishops can try and further weaken those dark squares. So, a very interesting dark square campaign. a5, we have bishop f4, a4, and now white slows down black's queenside play with a3. Keeping the pawns as solid as, as practically possible without using too many resources. The rook hasn't moved off a1, so not too much movement as well in general. Knight a5, knight e3. Now, this provokes actually the move d4, which weakens e4. So it's an interesting move to go en route to g4 like that rather than say the h2 route. This is the more scenic route, inviting tempo gains. We have bishop a6, bishop a3 h3 
and black accepts the invitation for a tempo gain d4 but weakens e4 how significant is that in this position knight f1 we have now uh, knight b6 knight g5 knight d5 so is black sitting well here yeah, there are dark squares in white's position which uh, look a little bit vulnerable at this point so this is at move 18 the bishop drops back looking at protecting c3 and tying down the queen actually for a moment it's protecting the knight so bishop d2 okay so what does black play here we have the committal bishop takes g5 being played Uh, so bishop takes g5 and the bishop comes back to recapture that bishop takes g5 queen d7 and now uh, the white queen goes in with queen h5 on move 21 this looks really dangerous without a sort of guardian of the king these soft spots look a little bit more dangerous than usual especially h7 right now is only protected by the king and look at this square e4 could that be used by white in this particular position very very interesting uh, we have rook fc8 as though the queen side counterplay is going to be enough knight d2 looking to use the e4 square here potentially knight c3 at least stopping knight e4 and there's an option of capturing but it does take away from the f6 square and guess what brilliant move fisher played here in response uh, to that at move 23 white play if I give you five seconds here what would you play in this position okay a dark square campaign is uh, being celebrated with Bishop f6 it seems far too dangerous to take this and own that dreaded form pawn uh, that looks as though it will be uh, exceptionally dangerous I'll check the analysis detailed analysis game video uh, above for uh, variations here so bishop f6 we have queen e8 knight e4 and now we have g6 queen g5 so it's tempting to go to h6 but maybe you know queen f8 is adequate here uh, so we have knight takes e4 rook takes e4 c4 but now white really opens up things can you guess the attacking move played in this position if I give you five seconds that move 27 what does Fisher play here okay h5 this this nice pivot of the e4 square which was weakened earlier it can be used by the rook now it's very very dangerous c takes and in fact instead of recapturing we have rook h4 we have rook a7 trying to have an, a defensive mechanism along that second rank bishop g2 what's going on here with bishop g2 offering another pawn queen h6 threatening mate but surely black can defend here with queen f8 what did fisher have in mind and i've shown many students this is a puzzle position really fantastic final puzzle position white to play here okay that e4 square is marvelous queen takes h7 king uh, and here black resigned if king takes hg check if king g8 there's rook h8 and if we go back if king takes here then we use that e4 square bishop e4 is checkmate so a really wonderful finish one of my favorite bobby fisher finishes i love testing people on that final position <laughs> so what are the philosophical points here that I think are important I think it shows that cold spring style openings like the King's engine attack are pretty solid and also aggressive they have a lot of pent-up energy and attacking potential point two I think Nimzovich protection of overprotection rather of e5 when black castles kingside remains an important concept uh, today you know sometimes you can get these nice binds which start with overprotecting a central point. Point three, consider how to limit the opponent's queenside counterplay. So there was such a little pawn moves like a3 to slow black down a little bit. 
Sometimes you have that in the King's Engine, you play subtle little moves just to slow down the opponent a little bit while playing on the other side of the board. Trying to keep the, the structure as intact as possible. Point four, getting important resources like the Queen to you know the soft spots around the King is, is really it's it's so obvious the point it's hiding in, in plain sight at this point that especially when key defensive pieces are driven away from the king, you know, celebrate those soft spots with your heavy heavy pieces like the queen, the heavy mob. Five, watch out for the central pivot squares. You know, that E four was marvellous. That the route the route the knight took to provoke, you know, the weakening of E four, that was such an important pivot square later for the rook and then the bishop really amazing pivot central square to get more resources into an attack so attacking via central key central squares might be the lesson there uh, which you've actually provoked as well so it's something he actually created with black neglecting that e4 square earlier so very very interesting game there okay let's go for another game here this is another one of my great game fav favorites Fisher against Paul Benko who is a ca real character in his own right this is a 1963 US chess championship apparently the story goes uh, Paul Benko might have been uh, on a hot date the night before he's a bit knackered for this game or something not quite with it uh, so he's playing black against Fisher as well maybe he just he just thought he was going to lose anyway so took it easy the night before Night, night on the town. So g6, and he played the modern defense, which uh, Raymond Keane uh, is a noted specialist uh, in this hypermodern system. So what happened here, though, in 1963? D4, Bishop g7, Knight c3, D6. Fisher played the Austrian attack f4, one of the most aggressive approaches. Knight f6, Knight f3, Black castled. Bishop d3 and yeah quite a modern idea Bishop g4 give up the light square Bishop maybe put pressure on the dark squares later how well does it work against Fisher this particular idea here we have h3 prompting the Bishop to give itself up Queen takes and now dark square play Knight c6 it seems uh, we've covered this idea before and it's under more favorable uh, circumstances sometimes Bishop e3 and now hitting those dark squares with e5 so it seems as though black's got a pretty logical coherent strategy actually in some respects at least d takes d takes and now Fisher plays f5 black plays g takes f5 which kind of compromises the structure around the king a bit Queen takes knight d4 uh, okay so we have Queen f2 Knight e8, white castles, knight d6, and now queen g3 pinning that bishop, king h8 unpinning. Now the queen's slightly moving here, queen g4, looking at that soft spot h7 perhaps. So queen g4, c6, and yes, it's eyeing the soft spot. But isn't this bishop blocked in at the moment? Or can we liberate that bishop? Queen e8, and in fact, it looks really, really dangerous here. Fisher plays bishop takes d4, e takes d4, and guess what Fisher plays in this position, which is a remarkable and stunning resource. And many people find this tricky when I ask them about it to find White's way of winning this particular position. So if I give you five seconds to pause the video, what would you play in this position starting from now? Okay, not e5 because black has f5 hitting your queen blunting the diagonal defending uh, things no you want to shut down that resource f5 spectacularly in fact with rook f6 a real blockading sacrifice quite fairly unique kind of tactic really stunning black played king g8 yeah if we look at this you know e5 without any defensive resource is pretty devastating so uh, King G8, E5, H6, trying to lure Rook takes H6. Uh, Fisher is not having that. He's just waiting with Knight E2 now. And this is just totally hopeless for Black. Black actually resigned. If the Knight moves, then just Queen F5, and it's going to be mate next on H7. So just 
this move just waiting for the knight to move away to use the f5 square 21 moves really stunning concise uh, fantastic game in my view what are the philosophical points there I think number one from a practical point of view try and get a good night's sleep before playing any legends like Bobby Fischer <laughs> don't go out all night on a hot day necessarily <laughs> but unless you're really convinced you're gonna lose uh, point two um, see how to cut out the opponent's defensive resources so rook f6 is a great example where you don't want the opponent to have defensive resources and sometimes there's some really amazing moves you can play on the chessboard just to shut that all down all the defenses down to so rook f6 a real defense resource crusher move point three as we've seen before aim for soft spots pretty direct with the queen shifting around to go to the h7 soft spot soft spots around around the king and point four pretty bleedingly obvious when you've identified a soft spot try and get the heavy mob like the queen near the opponent's king point five you know create, creating a dangerous queen and bishop battery against the soft spots is often dangerous and especially if you can shut down as in this game uh, any defensive resource against that battery like the rook f6 pretty obvious philosophical points actually <laughs> I thought they're kind of concrete though for this particular game arise from this particular game I, I hope you got something from those and the other points I've made in these other remarkable games I really enjoy all of these games uh, aesthetically uh, tactically positionally in many different directions I enjoy these games so I thought it was nice to recap them and I hope you might check out the uh, the more detailed videos if you want to get your teeth into the more of the variations and the nitty-gritty of what's going on so I hope you enjoyed this video uh, please do give it uh, a like and a share with friends wherever if you enjoyed it thanks very much